Okay, so now we're going to get into a discussion of measurements and calculations, which are very important concepts in any scientific endeavor and especially in chemistry. Now, the first area we're going to look at is the whole notion of scientific notation. Now, scientific notation is very important because very often in science, we will encounter very, very huge numbers, such as the number of atoms in a particular substance, or very small numbers, such as the size of an atom expressed in, let's say, meters. So, as you can imagine, these numbers are very large and very small and therefore very cumbersome to deal with because you have to deal with a whole lot of digits, especially zeros, as you can see in, the, in these two examples. So, this whole scientific notation concept was developed in order to deal with numbers such as these. So as you can see in the first example where we have this huge number we can actually make it more compact and this number will turn out to be equal to this here 6.022 times 10 to the 23 and that is this number expressed in scientific notation. So as you can see in this number here there are two parts to the scientific notation. You have this part the 6.022 and then you have the 10 raised to the 23, all right? Um, the previous way of expressing a number, we call it standard notation, all right? In the second example, again, you see the scientific notation given here, while the standard notation is given above. So what we're going to look at is how do we actually get from the standard notation to the scientific notation? And if you understand that, then you should be able to do the reverse. So... The way we go about this is that we start off with a standard notation and then we move the decimal point in that number so that it is located just to the right of the first non-zero digit, all right? The new number that is created as a result of that, you follow that up with the multiplication sign. Now that new number, we call that the coefficient. So we end up with the new number, which is a coefficient. We follow that up with the multiplication sign, multiplication sign then the 10, and then the exponent or the power that the 10 is raised to. Now, that number we get by determining the number of places the decimal point was shifted to get the coefficient. So whatever that number turns out to be, that will be the exponent. So we're going to see um, a couple of examples of this. So here is the first example. Let me go here. So here's the first example. You're given 6419. And the question is asked for you to convert that to scientific notation. And as you can see in the parentheses, it says that you need to move the decimal point three places to the left so that you end up with the coefficient. So this is the original number. Now, the decimal point is not explicitly shown, but of course we understand it to be right to the right of the last digit, the 9. So if we move it one place to the left, then the exponent becomes 1, right? Because we have moved it one place to the left, so therefore the number becomes 641.9 times 10 to the 1. However, this is not the scientific notation um, representation of this number because we need to get the decimal point to the right of 6. So if we move it another place, the exponent becomes a 2, and if we move it where we want it, which is right next to the 6, then the exponent becomes 3, and therefore this would be the number, original number given here in standard notation expressed in scientific notation, 6.419 times 10 to the 3. The 6.419 would be the coefficient in this case, and the 3, of course, would be the exponent, all right? Now, in this case, we're dealing with a relatively large number, but what if the number was relatively small, such as this example right here? 0 0.000654. As you can see here, in order to get the coefficient, we would have to move the decimal point to the right of this 6 here. In other words, we'd have to move it four places to the right. So this is the original number. And notice what happens here with respect to the exponent. When we move it one place to the right, the exponent becomes negative. So that is a marked difference from what we saw in the previous example. When we move the decimal place, decimal point one place to the left, the exponent is positive. But when we move it to the right, the exponent becomes negative. So if we move it to the right again, the exponent becomes minus 2. Move it again, becomes minus 3. And then when we get it to where we want it, 
right to the right of the 6, the exponent becomes minus 4. So therefore, it is 6.54 times 10 to the minus 4. The 6.54 will be the coefficient, and the minus 4 will be the exponent. All right? So that's how we write down or determine the scientific notation if you're given the number in standard notation. And as I said before, if you're given a scientific notation expression, then you should be able to work backwards to get it to the standard notation. Okay, so let's talk about measurements and um, uncertainty when it comes to measuring uh, any quantity. So whenever you measure anything, and I'm quite sure we're familiar with this from our previous experience, um, you know, there are two types of numbers involved, right? Um, measurement, of course, is very important in sciences. Um, if you're doing any experiments, you can't avoid doing some sort of measurement. Measurement of volume, measurement of mass, measurement of length, etc. All right? So I was saying that there are two parts to any, any measured value. You have the numerical part, which is basically the quantitative value, and then you have the units, right? And it is totally meaningless to mention one without the other. And as you can see in this example, you can have relationships between units representing um, some measured quantity. So in this particular case, 70.0 kilograms is equal to 154 pounds. And you're going to see a lot of these relationships later on. Now, with any measured value, you have to determine what are known as the significant figures. The significant figures are those digits that we are certain about in a measured value plus one estimated digit that we are not certain about. All right. So every measured value have a finite number of significant figures. So if you're given a question where you're given some measured value, for example, what you see here on the screen, and you want to determine the number of significant digits, what you have to recognize is that the first, um, in this case, five digits, would be significant, but the last remaining digit is an estimated value, all right? And, you know, the type of estimated value you end up with is based on the scale that you're using to determine that estimated value, all right? Here's another example. Again, in this particular measured value, the first five digits we're certain about, but the zero is, again, an estimated digit, and therefore we are uncertain about it. All right, so... I'm going to utilize this example of reading a thermometer. We can apply this to other instruments, but I'm just going to use a thermometer to illustrate how we determine the number of significant digits from a direct measurement. So here we have three thermometers, all right? And um, the red uh, marking here represents the mercury, all right, that is in the thermometer. So let's concentrate on the first thermometer to the left. Now. The first thing you need to pay attention is the scale that is etched on the thermometer, right? So you'll notice that you have a 20 here, and then you have a 30 up here, and you have 10 equal divisions, all right? And you'll notice that in this particular case, the mercury level is slightly above the first marking here um, from the 20. So this is 20, this is 21, this is 22. So therefore, this mercury level is just above 21. So the first thing we can conclude is that this mercury is representing a temperature of 21 point something, right? Which means that we are certain about the 2 and the 1 in 21. What we are not certain about is the digit that follows after the decimal point. In other words, we don't know if it's 21.1 or 21.2 or 21.3. We don't know, right? We know it's 21 point something. So to figure out what that digit would be after the decimal point, we have to make an estimation. We have no choice. That's the best we can do. So one person could look at this and say, I think this is 21.2 degrees Celsius, right? Another person could just as reasonably look at this and say, no, I don't think so. I think it's 21.1. All right. So that illustrates the fact that we cannot be completely certain about any measured value. So therefore, in this particular case, it's actually 21.2. Um, but the 2 after the decimal point is an estimated digit, and therefore we are not certain about it. So if another person said it was 21.1, that person would be just as correct. And as you can see, because that 2 is an estimated digit, and because we're certain about the first two, two digits, the 2 and the 1, 
then the number of significant digits being expressed here is 3. All right? Okay, so in the case of the second thermometer, it's the same system of graduation that you see here as in the case of the first. But in this case, the mercury level, it seems as if it's exactly at the 22 mark. So you might be tempted to say, well, the temperature being represented here is 22. However, it is not as simple as that because whatever the level of precision that is represented by this thermometer will be the same as this thermometer. In other words, whatever the number of decimal places that you have to round off to or estimate to, you have to do the same thing here. So therefore, if you think that the mercury level is exactly at the 22 mark, then the temperature reading that you'd have to record must be 22.0. So in other words, you have to put a zero here to indicate that this zero here is an estimated digit. And therefore, uh, we're not certain about that. All right. So therefore, the number of significant figures being expressed here is three significant figures. All right. Now, in the third and final thermometer that we're dealing with, you'll notice that the scale that is used here is different from the others because in addition to the larger units of 21, 22, 23, and so on, we have 10 equal divisions between, let's say, 20 and 21, right? So we know that each of these smaller divisions represent a 0.1 degree unit, all right? So based on that, um, let's see what happens here. The mercury level seems to be just above 22.1. So therefore, we are certain of it being 22.1, but we are not certain about the digit that comes after the one. So we know that it is 22.1 something. We don't know what that something is. So a person could look at this and say, well, this looks like 21.11, right? Another person could look at it and say, well, no, I think it's 21.12. All right, so both persons would be just as correct. Um, the actual temperature here represented is 22.11 because the last digit... Um, which is the estimated one, is uncertain. And therefore, the number of significant figures being represented here is four. And because you have a greater number of significant figures here, there is a greater level of precision associated with this thermometer compared to the first two. So I hope that that illustrates the, um, how we end up with the number of significant figures from a direct measured value. Okay, now... In science, there are two types of numbers that we will encounter. We just encountered one type, which are measured numbers. And as we can see from the examples that we looked at, these numbers have associated with them a finite number of significant figures. On the other hand, you have another group of numbers known as exact numbers, right? And these numbers, unlike the measured numbers, have an, a, an infinite number of significant figures. Now, what do we mean by exact numbers? Well, exact numbers are those numbers that you obtain by two ways, either by counting or by definition. So, for example, if you count um, a simple counting of, you know, different items, let's say five balls, right? We have five balls here. That number five is an exact number because all we did was just count the number of balls. We did not have to measure anything. We did not have to use an instrument to determine the number of balls. We just simply know it's five balls, all right? So that five is an exact number. Um, the other type of numbers are those numbers that are obtained by definition. So for example, we know that 12 inches is equal to one foot, all right? That is a defined relationship. And therefore, the 12 and the one in this relationship are both exact numbers. Here's another example, the relationship between the centimeter unit and the meter unit, all right? Again, that's by definition. And therefore, these numbers, the 100 and the 1 in that relationship are exact numbers. So it is very important, and you're going to see this uh, become very important in future problem-solving exercises. Whenever you are doing calculations, you have to determine which numbers are exact and which numbers are measured, right? The measured numbers are the numbers that you obtain by measuring, right? The exact numbers are obtained by either counting or by definition. And that will become very important, especially when it comes to rounding off numbers to the correct number of significant figures um, that you obtain from calculation. Okay, 
So now we're going to get into the different rules for determining the number of significant figures. And these rules, for the most part, have to do with zeros in particular situations. But the first rule is very simple. The first rule has to do with non-zero um, digits in a measured value. And basically this rule, as you can see on the screen, it says all non-zero numbers are significant. So any number that is non-zero, they are significant. It's as simple as that, right? So for example, in the example that you see here, 461, there are three significant figures represented in this number. Okay, let's look at this now. This rule says um, it deals with a zero in a situation where the zero is sandwiched between non-zero digits. So this rule says a zero is significant when it is between non-zero digits. And as you can see in the first situation here, um, first example, I should say, 401, zero here is sandwiched between the four and the one. So therefore, there are three significant digits represented here. Here's another example. Now, in this example, you'll see that there are more than one zero sandwiched between two non-zero digits, right? So we have these two zeros between a three and a six. So therefore, those zeros are significant. So the total number of significant digits here would be five. And I'd like to point out that even though you have a decimal point here in this particular situation, it doesn't change anything. The number of significant figures will remain the same. Um, here's a third example. Again, there's a decimal point. Again, you have a zero sandwiched between two non-zero digits. So therefore, that zero is significant. Okay. Now here we have a situation, another rule, where we're talking about a zero at the end of a number where there is a decimal point in the number. And this rule basically says that those zeros are significant, right? So if you have a number and you have zeros at the end of a number, and if you have a decimal point anywhere in that number, then those zeros are significant. So the example showed, shown here, you have three zeros, you have um, at the end of the number, you have a decimal point here, then those zeros are significant. Now, it does not matter where the decimal point is, right? If you have a decimal point here, or here, or here, or the decimal point was in front of the five, then those zeros would still be significant. All right? Here's another example. In this case, you have one zero at the end of the number here. You have the decimal point here. So therefore, the zero is significant, and therefore, the total number of significant digits here is five. Um, now, let's deal with a situation here where the zeros are not significant. It says here, the zero is not significant when it is before the first non-zero digit. So, if you have zeros before the first non-zero digit, then those zeros are not significant. So, here is an example. In this case, you have three zeros coming before the first non-zero digit. So, therefore, the only digit which is significant is the non-zero digit, which is in this case is a six. Here's another example. In this case, we have two types of zeros. We have the zero that come before the first non-zero digit, and we have this zero, which is sandwiched. We already learned earlier that this zero would be significant. We just are learning now that this zero would not be significant. So therefore, the total number of significant digits here will be three. Um, here is, um, okay, so here's another rule. A zero is not significant when it is at the end of a number without a decimal point. So if there are no decimal points and you have zeros at the end of the number, then those zeros are not significant. So in the example that you see here, no decimal point shown. We have four zeros at the end. The only significant digit here will be the five. Here's another example. In this particular case, we have one zero here, no decimal point. So therefore, this zero is at the end of the number. And therefore, it's not significant. So therefore, there's only four significant digits represented here in this number. OK, we're going to stop here for today, um, for now. This um, topic that is coming up next is what we're going to start off from in the next.